I guess most of you know, even if you don't my name is John Pendlebury at school here, at School of Architecture Planning Maths Coaching. Before my main duty this evening of introducing uh, tonight's distinguished speaker, the first thing I have to do is actually jump ahead in time and give you a forewarning of the next uh, lecture in the series, which will be by Professor Rachel Armstrong uh, from the school, Professor of Experimental Architecture. And Rachel will be talking on the theme of catalyzing the transition from an industrial age to an ecological era. And that will be here, hopefully it's like warmer here, on Thursday 22nd of January at this time. I apologise, it is a bit chilly in here. We've got a heater going here, which we're probably going to have to switch off because it's a bit distracting for speaking. But I think we are going to probably start halfway through the lecture, yeah, halfway through the lecture do some exercises and um, just to kind of warm everybody up. So it's my pleasure this evening to um, introduce Professor Hector Roo, who is a visiting professor here in the school. Um, and in for his day job is a professor of spatial planning at Groningen University. There's a very long standing relationship between the cities of Newcastle and Groningen, and they are twin the cities in the uh, sister cities. And there's a very long standing relationship between Hertz and the school as well, right? We were talking earlier, I reckon we first met uh, in about 1996, so Hertz and Newcastle go back uh, a long way, it's a very old friend of the school. He is, of course, also a very distinguished scholar, um, and amongst Things I should mention is that uh, Pat has, has performed the role of, of both Secretary General and President of the Association of uh, European Schools of Planning. One other tiny little thing I'll mention is that one of Pat's current passions is a, a digital platform for books or, uh, called In Planning, which, particularly for those of you, maybe PhD students looking for to do some monograph of your work, it may be something you'd be interested to explore with Pat at some time. But I think that's all the introduction you're going to get there. So, over to you. Over to Ruth. Thank you all very much. Um, Anne, where are you? Should I use this microphone or is it fine? I can hear you okay. Is you can okay? hear me. Everyone else too. Turn the seat off. This is the well, we might get cold. You turn it off. I don't mind. I, I will walk around anyway, so and do my exercise. But so uh, you might get cold. Yeah, can we keep it on? Right. Hold the nose. Okay. Um, let's see how to do this. Um, and I have to push the button every time. To get a new slide or. Um, yeah, it's a button. So button. It's a Okay. Right, okay. Anyway, um, that means a bit of walking, which is good, because it's cool. John introduced me nicely, thank you very much, John. Uh, he also told me you will hardly get any audience. Well, uh, unfortunately you are all here. He told me this is, this room is very hard to find. Um, it's the wrong time of the year. The weather is bad. And there is an old poster still hanging around, so no one knows that you're there. Well, there you are. You're all here. <laughs> one thing is not different from my own experience, is apparently the presenter or the speaker always has tuberculosis, because there's always this gap here. This is strange, isn't it? Okay, let's see how we do this. Oh yeah, who of you has an interest in non-linearity? Because I was not so much afraid of people not showing up, I'm afraid of people leaving during my presentation because I might lose you. Most people stay. This is really, really, really big, exciting thing. Anyway, the excitement of non-linearity, that's what I'm going to talk about. And um, probably my problem is that I'm quite often too excited, and I might go too fast, or I might go into a direction 
that you say, well, wait a minute, we, won't we don't follow you anymore, please let me know. Wave or say something. That might be helpful. Okay, I'll stop and try to explain things a little bit better. Um, and I've tried, of course, to come up with wonderful pictures. I even made one picture today, which I thought this is a good picture for the presentation today. Unfortunately, I have a new iPhone and I have no idea with this new one how to get the picture from here on my PowerPoint. So I'm sorry, this is not going to happen. I might talk about it a little bit later when I'm near the place where I wanted to position this picture. Anyway, here we are. I'm a planner. A, social, a spatial planner, but we're going to talk about social complexity. And my talk is going to question uh, time. What about time and planning? Because we planners, if we plan, we plan sort of the future, isn't it? Um, but the question is, how much time do we include in our reasoning? With complexity. Time cannot be, you know, pushed to the side. Time is always an issue, and this is what I'm going to talk about. And it's not just including time in planning as such, but if you include time in the sense of complexity sciences, time comes with weird things. Non-linearity, for example. Transitions, coevolution, emergence. And I hope to talk a bit about these issues, and I hope at the end of the lecture, you're still with me, and you are as excited as I am. I see Andy already fading away. I'm still with you. You will be my criteria. <laughs> okay. Okay. Let's go. My two heroes. Let's start with my two heroes. These are not planets, although I, I know great planets. But my two heroes, sorry, are these two. One long time gone. One just recently passed away. I start with Fibonacci. You must know him. There was no idea who Fibonacci is. You see, everyone knows him. <laughs> Mandelbrot. Does that name ring a bell? Some are shaking their heads. Okay. These two are, in a way, mathematicians. They deal with numbers. And these numbering, these numbers are for me exciting because they present a metaphor that relates to something that has nothing to do with us, our generation. I will try to explain to you my idea about our generation. I think we are linear, we are cubes, we are straightforward. But these two come up with ideas that are different. And these different ideas, these ideas trigger us in looking at ourselves and therefore also looking at how we deal with planning. Let's see, let's start with Fibonacci. Here, the Fibonacci sequence. 1, 1, 2, 3, 5, 8, 13, 21, etc. It creates figures, shapes that are sort of self repetitive. They're not linear. They're fractal. I hope you do know what a fractal is. But also, it's a figure self similar, multi levels. And it's a wonderful metaphor to look at the world. RGPR, Royal Town Planning Institute, 100 years old. It's awfully old. Really totally all. But look at this logo. I have no idea what the story is behind the logo, but it's the Fibonacci sequence. There must be a reason. I've not looked into the history of RTPR. Maybe they used it because it's a fancy figure, with not having an idea what it's for, but I guess they have some sort of idea. But the Fibonacci sequence is important for this story. It's everywhere. In sunflowers, here, you, know, you can even eat it, the Fibonacci sequence if you want. Self-similar. It repeats itself continuously. Here. It's even up there, the clouds. A bit of a good storm, and it explains, it shows the Fibonacci sequence. 
So what's my point here? The Fibonacci sequence somehow is elegant. Somehow it explains some sort of hidden rhythm out there. The rhythm we appreciate because this is a rhythm. Well, some see the Fibonacci sequence in here. And why is the Fibonacci sequence there? Did the architects at that time know about the Fibonacci sequence? No, probably not. But apparently it's good for our eyes. We appreciate the rhythm of the sequence. Therefore, it comes back. Apparently, also the iPhone has the divine proportion 1.618 something, which relates again to the Fibonacci sequence. The divine proportion. Now I'm getting at my point. The Fibonacci sequence was a sequence which was discovered somewhere in one of the Arabic countries, or maybe even in India. This rhythm of 1, 1, 2, 3, 5, 8, etc. came visible in nature, in reality out there, and was seen ages ago by monks, perhaps, monks called scientists, but as a rhythm that was representing our dear Lord and his meaning of what to do with the world, how the world should function. Mathematicians became important because apparently they were able to show us these hidden Rhythms. And one of them, of course, then is the Fibonacci sequence. And I can show you an example how it worked ages ago. This rhythm is being used by church to build up something they think considered important because it sort of brought them closer to our dear Lord. It had the idea. They were bridging the gap between us humans and the divine. This guy you all know, this Cardinal Richelieu, he invested most of his life, as we all know, hunting the three musketeers. Yeah? And that's been shown to us through various popular movies. The good news is, he never got them, the three musketeers. In that respect, he failed. Apparently, about, aside from being a villain and you know hunting the three musketeers, he seems well, he probably was a good minister because he was given by King Louis the I believe, a piece of land to build an entirely new town, to build a chateau, and to build a park for himself. And of course, the town was called Ville de Richelieu. The chateau was called the Chateau de Richelieu. And what he did was building something from scratch. And he used the Fibonacci sequence. Here you are. Build the tower, the chateau, and the park. And he was believing that this fits very well with the rhythm of nature, the rhythm that God gave. Divine rhythm. Quite interesting. And please do go there. Wander through town. Go to the information at the tourist office and read the book about Ville de Richelieu. And you see there are more <coughs> symbolic rhythms to be found. But this is one that's interesting for us because, what's the idea? Is that a long time gone, we were apparently planning our world according to divine proportions. Cities in a circle way within the center, a church, and here a rhythm also representing something divine, but for me it's important, it's also a non-linear structure. In the very past, apparently, we planned already, but in a non-linear way. And that changed, fundamentally, I would say, with this. The moment the Industrial Revolution began to show quite disastrous consequences, entire neighborhoods with people getting sick because they were heavily polluted. Ebenezer Howard came with the Garden City, and we all know about that. But the Garden City is for also a concept that not just showing a world, a utopia, that's wonderful and a good place to live in, in the green, 
here in the satellite towns around the core centre where all the production is supposed to be. But the Garden City is also a shift from a parts to the functional era. Straight lines to get from the satellite towns to the centre of production. It's the beginning of functionality. It's the beginning of us. Us being linear, straightforward. Because with the Industrial Revolution, we became functional, we became minimal, we became standardized, and we became, became equal. Those four notions are the notions, I believe, of the 20th century. And that's what we are. That's what we are. Look at this picture. We are functional. We believe in straightforwardness. Direct causal relationships. That's us. I think 10 years ago, the Dutch paid about 85, 85 million euros to purchase a painting, that one, the last painting made by Mondrian. He died before it was finished. So the painting was not even finished, but we bought it for an incredible amount because it represents us. It's minimal. Supposed to present linearity. Here, yeah, this chair, no, this, 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 this chair, also a famous chair within my country, the Netherlands, because it's a Rigveld chair, a symbol of modernism. It's not meant to sit in because it will hurt your back. It's really a painful chair, but it's what it is. You can see from the outside immediately this is a chair, and it's not meant to be anything else. It's very basic, very minimal. Still apparently doing this with cars, but of course every architect knows the Seagram building, reasonably for the Roa, created this as a statement of minimalism, functionality, its standard. Every floor is the same. You can see from the outside immediately what they're doing inside. I'm not sure how many architects there are in this room. I hope you're all planners. Because architects are supposed to adore this building. Let's be fair, it's so minimal, it's also even boring in a way. It's us, straightforward. As I said, we are cubes. I found this picture, and I found another statue this morning at the uh, quayside. A great statue which represents also sort of this us being cubes. I made a picture, but as you know, the tragedy is I could not copy it to a PowerPoint because I'm terrible with digital stuff. But anyway, this is us. This, to my understanding, symbolizes us. We are cubes, we are squares, we are linear. This is a great thing because it stands in front of the central library in Nice and it means thinking inside the box. Well, that's not how the phrase goes. The phrase goes, thinking outside the box. But that's precisely the point. The moment you're part of this paradigm of linearity, it's incredibly hard to get out of it, to take a distance and to see anything else. Thinking inside the box is precisely, get us. We are linear, we are straightforward. Apparently there are three floors with books in it. Who has been, been there in Nice? In here, no one? Me now, me now. Let's see where I am. Oh yes, we are cubes. Well, let's move on and see how we are shaping the world to our liking. The control world, the functional world, the standardized world. This is a neighborhood very near my university. It's very repetitive. That's us. And if you look at the buildings over there, this one, for example, it's like the Seagram building. Only for us humans, normal people, and if you have a bit of time, and you stand in front of the building, you can actually see the inside what people are doing, what program they are watching on TV. That's us. This is definitely a straightforward 20th century building. It's my fact. 
Your fenders are on the third floor. <coughs> but inside it's not that bad. It's not that bad. Look at the entire neighborhoods. The neighborhoods of the 20th century. Repetitive. If you don't know the name of your street and you don't know the direction, you're lost because all streets look the same. The thing is, if one house goes down the drain, probably they all go, go down the drain. This is brick metal. But there's no reason why. <laughs> Again, back to my country. We've cut all trees. Most countries did this because it was a good way to stay warm 100 years ago. We cut all trees. So the trees we see here in my country are all planned. Go with the tree to the Netherlands and look at the forests you see, and you see them all in line. That's what we do. The problem is if one tree gets sick, they all get sick, because they're all the same type. There's no variety. We are so structured, we are so ordered, that even if we stand in line because of a traffic jam, we stand orderly in line. We are cubes, we are linear. This is so much us. This is the 20th century generation. And if we move from outside the empirical world to inside and think about <coughs> our own reasoning and how it's structured, we see, I think, basically this. This is plain theory. It comes from philosophy through the general sciences, system thinking, etc. Sociology, there you have planning as part of. Social sciences, and through that you see various approaches within planning. And they all can be put on this, what we in Korean call the holy spectrum of planning rationality. The technical rationality with one true world, and the communicative rationality, which has strong support to this school, um, communicative rationality, which is on an uncertain world where you go for agreements. But these rationalities, with on the one hand the technical, certain world, and a factual reality, and on the other side the communicative rationality where you go for consensus and for an agreed reality, you go for the decision. Let's do this here and now. And in a technical reality world, the decision already includes the future because there is a direct causal relationship with the future, you assume. On the other extreme, you go for the consensus, and then within the consensus, you assume that the decision you agree to will incorporate the future. In other words, in our learning theory, there is not much space for time. We are linear. We are straightforward. We've seen various paradigm shifts in planning. One is from the technical rationale to sort of a, a scenario understanding of planning with bounded rationality such as the notions that are, are seen as important. In the early 90s we made a tremendous shift to the other extreme, which we call the communicative, the collaborative, the interactive, etc. We just wrote a book, I think two years ago, on about what would be next. What would be beyond this, this spectrum? Or is the communicative the answer? Or is this holy spectrum the answer? And this book explained what the future could be, because the future could include time. Nonlinearity. That was the reason of this book. And we asked one of the pillars of the communicative rationality, Judith Innes to say something nice about this book, and of course, that's what you do. You have a fact side of the book, you know, some important academic saying, well, this is a great book, you should buy it, because if you don't, you miss the point, something like that. So we asked her to do that. But in the book, various authors explain, look, this move away from the technical and the communicative rationality towards a non-linear understanding of planning might be a new paradigm. This might be, might be a third crisis. Of course, we haven't really had to. This might be the end of the communicative rationale, but also painful within, I think, this environment, because communicative rationale 
strongly that Greg's here in support of you and explained it. So I got in an email interaction with Juno's Innes. And she was explaining to me that this third crisis is a not very nice thing to say. And it's, she was worried about the message we're going to spread around, and etc., etc. And these emails extended and bigger and supported. I'm coming. I'm coming to Groningen. And we're going to talk. And through the lines, I began to understand that she is angry. She's coming, but not for a nice talk. So I emailed back, look, Judith, if you're coming to Groningen and you want to kill me, please stay away. <laughs> she went off and said, okay, that's not a reason for coming. I like the story. Of course, I have difficulty with this third crisis. But look, I've just published a book also on complexity. I believe in that story. But don't throw away the community. And she was very right. As we never ever throw away the technical rationale while talking the communicative. Because both matter. And of course, our heritage with the technical rationale and the communicative rationale are important to planets. Because that's why we understand the world as it is, as it comes to us here and now. With complexity, we might add something. And that's, of course, the argument we have. The question is, what are we adding? Are we going to get a complete new set of notions, new set of understandings, as we got through the communicative rationale, for example? The language of the communicative rationale is entirely different from the language you would use within the technical rationale environment. A language that relates to uncertainty, relates to actors dealing with each other, trying to reach an understanding by agreeing, instead of talking about facts, <coughs> and causalities, and these kind of things. So what are the words and the notions we would get if we explore the non-linear? That's the question then. And of course, from an academic perspective, would a non-linear perspective to the world help us to better understand <coughs> the issues we are facing? Does it? Or does everything become more fuzzy, blurred, and difficult? Because that would not really help us. So what we're doing now is we have seen Fibonacci and the divine parts. We have been looking at ourselves as being cubes. We now move into Mandelbrot and its fractals as a metaphor to look at the world in an entirely different way. The world is highly connected, multi-level, multi-layered, which is very much contextual, but as well as very much related to the subsystems, the very parts of the whole. We are looking at a world that's in flow, it's never ever is stable. There's one constant in this world that's changed itself. How to deal with that? And does it relate to reality? That's the question. Well, if we look back in time, we can see that already a long time ago, some scholars were touching on this issue. Here, for example, Cristola with a multi-level perspective to the world, with notes, urban notes, uh, representing various levels of scale, which relates to specializations, etc which were different at various levels. Here, Doxianis. Architects might know him, but planners ignored him entirely. Which shows these ideas of a world being highly connected. Again, at various levels of scales, he was quite popular in the 60s. No one knows him anymore these days. Two scholars that are trying to explain to us the benefits of nonlinearity. Mike Batty from Lucia and Yuba Potipani from Tel Aviv trying to share with us their ideas about simulations through nonlinear systems. Mike Batty has created a fractal of London. You 
Yuval Portugali phrasing the notion of self-organization, self-organizing cities. Self-organizing cities? Which means that the role of the planner is fundamentally changing from being the creator of space and place for herself, a true divine idea about the planner, I believe, the planner almost being God himself, to the planner being the mediator, trying to bring actors together, to now what? What will the planner be? If the city is self-organizing, if the system organizes itself, if the system is autonomously and spontaneously developing, how to look at that? And can we see examples of this? Is it really happening out there? There are a few models at the moment being studied on how to look at a world being nonlinear. One of them is a transition model. A jump from one stable level to the other. And we see it here and there. And as examples, let's look at them a bit further. Before I go into the examples, this is, of course, a linear world. We have a small income, and we hope that our income will increase a bit till it's the income we appreciate. Or we have a small car, and a couple of years want a bigger car, etc. But the car itself remains the same. With transitions, we see something else. We see a white circle transforming along the transition into a gray cube or square. And this represents what a transition might be a co evolution of structure and function. They both change through the transition. And I'm going to show you a few examples of how this works. But the fundamentally, fundamentality behind this is that you don't know at the beginning how this white circle will change. Will it change into a red circle? Or into a white square? Or into what? Of course this is a metaphor. But the difficulty is of a co-evolving transition the structure and function both change and you don't know, you cannot tell what the result will be. It creates unpredictability. You cannot predict as a fundamental aspect of our real world. That's interesting, isn't it? Question to you, how not to get lost? What will planners do? Well, there's a couple of words already there which are important from this non-linear perspective. Emergence, adaptivity, co-evolution already mentioned, self-organization already mentioned, path dependency, and transition itself. A dynamic change between phases of stability. New notions, which might be a set of tools to understand the world non-linear. And if we look back in time, we can actually see this. For example, if we look at cities themselves, cities being a wonderful example of a complex system which involves non-linear. Cities that have in the past been crossings, just crossings, after some time a crossing turns into a marketplace, because apparently people come together there and there it's easy to handle with your agriculture stuff. But if you have a marketplace, you know there's money around. So what you do is you want to keep it safe, build walls around it and so forth. And suddenly these cities turn into centers of production. And that's an entirely different thing than a safe place or a market. And now it is in the 20th century city for our cities. Very hard to define because they are plural. But these places are places to communicate, to have leisure, uh, democracy, etc. And in the end, we end up with flows and dynamics. And of course, cities are now the points where the local and the global meet. Cities are dynamic, are evolving, co evolving. Structure and function change through time together. This picture explains it a bit. Past, modern times, the distance from central business to city, what do we see through time? It's not just a jump from rural to urban, it's just straightforward.
forward jump, though the second order transitions are interesting. If you look at them, you see transitions. Between stable levels, you see jumps. Or in other words, between the dynamics of change, you have every now and then periods of stability. And it's not always going up. It can go down as well. And in complexity sciences, that does not really matter. So this might look awfully abstract to you, perhaps. But this is the example you all know yourself. Transitions of communication. Once upon a time, once upon a time, we were communicating through something, a device, that was not centered to our life. On the contrary, this thing was making noise, so we put in the corridor a very old-fashioned mobile, uh, mobile fixed phone connected to a line, etc. And you had to make, to make some effort to get someone on the other side. But that other one is precisely the other one you want to have. This one already came with options. You could dial a number, and you could reach very many friends as long as they have the same device. And it was no longer in the corridor, no, it moved to the center of the room. Quite often it was on the table next to the chair of Daddy. It became an important thing. It was already the connection to the world. And this was really neat because here it became a network. <coughs> Ten numbers this one could remember. Your parents were off course number one, your brother or sister number two, etc. A network. Really cool. But this was the real revolution. Instead of going to Debbie's chair and phone the one you wanted to talk to, you could carry your connection to the world with you, and you were continuously connected. A fundamental job where the meaning of communication fundamentally changed. You see structure and function changes. And now, the next step. Who has a smartphone? Right. Okay, who's not willing to raise his hand? <laughs> you see, we all have one. Are you allowed to lie? <laughs> you don't have a smartphone. That's not very smart. <laughs> the thing is, this is no longer a phone. This is everything. If I lose my smartphone, I lose more than myself. Because this is my identity. <laughs> this has all my friends in it. If I lose it, I lose my friends because I wouldn't know how to get in touch with them anymore. It makes pictures, and I know I'm not the person who knows how to get the pictures off this machine. <laughs> but that is just, you know, I've got to learn quickly. This is everything. This gives me information, this tells me a lot. Augmented reality is going to be our future, where we can show, and I can look at Jeff and say, oh, this is Jeff Weiger. He's going to have dinner with me. At least that's what he promised me. Right. You see, or you look at the building, and his building is, ah, oh, it's from the 30s. Right, cool. Oh. To know this bright star up there, even if it's a sphinx. This is a revolution. The structure and function of communication has fundamentally changed. That, as such, not such a worrying thing. But at this point, no one, but really no one, except from Steve Jobs. This will be the follow up. No one will know. And guess what? This machine is full of apps. It's a self organizing mechanism. It's a totally different device. But it came from somewhere. So the part of the is quite weird. Structure and function change, and you get an entirely different meaning of communication, of information. And that's really exciting. Anyway, back to our own, 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 own issues. Energy planning. It's becoming quite a popular thing because fossil energy is going down the drain. It's going to end. Uh, the Russians are quite nasty these days, so ge geopolitics comes in and we have to find other ways of, uh, of, of, of creating energy, obviously. And there are numerous others, other reasons. 
Newcastle is quite up, but you might drown if the sea table goes up. My country, half of it is below sea level. So if the sea level goes up with one meter, the deepest point of our country, 6.35, will go to 7.35, and of course, this one extra meter will bring us back. Energy is an issue. Energy is going through a transition, or we think it's going, and we hope it goes through a transition. From fossil energy, where space, therefore planets are more or less implicit, because energy is everywhere, and we have still no doubt where it's going to. Is it going to be hydrogen? That's enough. It's not a job. Renewable energy might become an issue. And renewable energy is very situational. It's related to local potentialities. Heat and storage. Thermal heat. Wind. If you're not near the coast, you get less wind, etc. So it's perhaps not that issue. But anyway, there's space. It becomes explicit. And you see now planners working on energy landscapes. Quite interesting. But it's a transition, and we all know it's going to revolutionize our way of keeping our house warm. As I said, my country is sort of half below sea level here, you see Cronin, is the northern part of the Netherlands. It's already quite, you know, full of lakes. But if we keep on consuming our energy as we do, this might happen in the future. From a leisure perspective, quite wonderful, but I assure you, the people in the province of Friesland will not appreciate it and ask us planners to do something. We all are adapting to warmer climate. As we can see, this is not how to joke too, but it explains quite well how we all adapt. And adapt means we're not controlling the environment, you know, we are adapting to it. If it gets warmer, you only use different clothing. If it's cold, like here, you keep on your warm stuff, etc. You're adapting to your environment. And adapting, adaptive pattern, is maybe an outcome which relates to the non-linear. Another example. The very explained transitions up are basically the same as transitions down. But through this example, I want to show you again, you're all part of nonlinearity. You're part of this world that goes through phases, phases of change, and the change you often create yourself. I call it the bike example. I took the time to make a few pictures very near my university to show you how it works. In the Netherlands, everyone understands this example because we're all. Bike driven, so to say. Here I'm not that sure, but you probably know what I mean. This is a sign, official sign, put there by the municipality. And the moment everyone sees a sign like this, they know the municipality is advising us an alternative route to the route you would normally take because probably there is something going on further on the road. Here it's a bike. So the municipality is advising you, basically they're ordering you, go to the right, because if you continue, you get in trouble. The Dutch are awfully ordered. As I said, even in a traffic jam, you're in line. Our houses are standing in line. Our trees are standing in line. But we're also human. The moment we're on a bike, it's anarchy. <laughs> there are no rooms. So this is useful. As you can see. There it says, it's closed, go to the right, because, you know, here even, it says, go to the Why not? It's not logical. You see, it's dangerous even what we do. Oh, sorry. If you follow the route, you will see another sign, and there you go. The thing is, though, thanks to my dear wife, who is with me, I waited so long to take a picture Till there were people on it, or to get people on it. Because she always tells me, if you want a nice picture, make sure people are on it. But it took me a while because no one is going there. 
there should, should be no one on the picture. This is the essence of the picture. But apparently these two had to be in this neighborhood. Because no one follows the rules. And there you go. This is the reason why you should not continue. The municipality is doing a good job. They're preparing a wonderful future. They're creating something nice in the, in the period to come because the road is under construction. It says clearly, go back. There's no reason to continue. You get stuck. Well, it's the same sort of symbolism as you have here. But what happens? What happens if everyone goes their own way? This is what happens. <laughs> All these individual bike pieces have not agreed together to do exactly the same thing, to bypass the old track, to ignore the rules, and to organize themselves a new path. The wonderful path. It really bikes well until it rains. Then it goes wrong. And you see, it's a stable level, but on a lower quality level. Lower quality. This is what happens. There you are. The point is now, this is what we call self-organization. Individual actors, all responding to something, what we call a cemetery break, and they all respond sort of in the same way that there is a pattern, a spontaneous pattern emerging. So individual actors doing their own thing, but you get a collective result. These mechanisms you see very often even in cities, a highly controlled space by planets. It happens. This is what you see everywhere, even in new cars. And it's the same pattern. Not following the nicely paved route. No, instead, we make shortcuts. Some are not even linear shortcuts, but that's what we all do together. It's within us. Elephant power. Easy to understand, but we can move on to show how a nonlinear world in between order and chaos can be a very functional world. Functional world. For example, here, this is an example of a highly controlled world. Obviously, the planning department has been part of this and said, look, we need traffic lights. The traffic lights are very much black and white. Yes, with red, you can continue. Oh, you, can, you have to stop with green, you can continue. But what you do see here is a mismatch between almost an empty street to continue and here. These people are in agony. They, they are in trouble. They know they won't make it with the following green line. In fact, it's even three times to wait to get through the traffic light. So there's pain over here, but highly ordered. This is what you do if you don't do anything. This is chaos. This is not functioning. It's even dangerous. But is there an option in between? Is there a self-organizing possibility? In land of England, uh, because you were, I believe, the inventors of the roundabout. As long as you don't have too many of those, they're awfully good because they give the responsibility <coughs> of following a certain route back to the driver, but avoid total chaos. If you have 20 in a row, you get awfully sick. So that's over the top, but quite often it works very well. Where am I? All right, yes. Well, I'm almost there, and I need a bit of water. Just one more example, and then I'll quit. Who has heard about the butterfly? John Perfect Goddess. This is the light. Why is it important for me in this story? Because it brings us back to 1963. John and I already agreed that it's an awfully good year for other reasons, but 1963 is a very interesting year. Because that was the moment that 
was this point raised by the super guy called Lawrence, stating, look, uncertainty is not just there at the very, very small level of particles, quantum mechanics. Uncertainty is also here around us. Human scale, which is quite crucial because that means that there is fundamental uncertainty in our own world, in our own life. From an academic perspective, we always try to, you know, to find the truth. True world. It means that this route for science is not, cannot be the only route. Lawrence was working with nonlinear simulation models to predict the weather. The moment he changed data, which he thought were exactly the da same data in his model, he saw an outcome that couldn't be because he was retyping his data. It was the same data, and still he got a different outcome. The thing was, he was not retyping exactly the same data, but he was instead of using five pitches after the point, typing three, which means that after dot one, two, three, the other numbers were ignored, and that was precisely the point. There was a very small difference between the two numbers. The first one he used in five, and then the three one. Very small change, but the outcome was a world apart. Which means that with his model, he could not really predict in a certain amount of time what the outcome would be with regard to the weather. He could not make the difference between a calm breeze and a hurricane. That's one of the things of nonlinearity. You cannot predict the future because it evolves through jumps and it can encounter jumps which are not linear. We call it disproportion. Nonlinearity relates to disproportion. This is too difficult to get into, but basically what he did with it is butterfly. It's a metaphor of a you know a butterfly flapping in, in the Amazon and it creates a, a hurricane or a tomato in, in New Orleans. But what it tells you here is if you go into this 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 mechanism from a stable route, suddenly you get two options. You go either through this hole or that one. While the difference between the options are very small, but the outcome is revolutionary. And again, well, not really real life, but it's a wonderful movie, a cult movie, made in Berlin, who explains precisely that small differences at the beginning might end up with huge differences at the end. And you all know this can happen to yourself your own life. If you leave this lecture hall, obviously all excited, just heard, <laughs> your path you want to continue might not go as you liked. The bus already gone, and suddenly it starts raining, and you get awfully wet, and you fall down. It's the downside of negative story. But something else might happen as well. You catch the bus, you get to this person, and it's an awfully nice person, you get to talk simply, and coincidentally, you <laughs> low level. If you have an option to see this movie, who has seen it? Ah! This you should tell the children what the movie is about, then I can go home. <laughs> Quick talk. Lola has an apartment over there, hey. And she's going, really, she's going to run to D. And she has a reason to, because her boyfriend phoned her, telling her that he lost money that was not his. Lola money. He lost it in the metro. And he definitely wants that money back. He wants that money back. And what he's going to do, he has a great idea. He's going to rob the supermarket. That's really a good idea. So <laughs> Lola thought, that's definitely not a good idea. I have to intervene. But it's a long route, this is Berlin. She has to run all this way. And of course, in the movie, you can see her running. That's the title of Lola Runs. But she's not going to run once. No, she's going to run three times. 
And it starts really with the beginning. She runs out of her apartment, and guess what? There is a punk. That's out of her apartment with a dog. The dog barks, and she gets scared. So she has to make an alternative route. It's a, and then everything unfolds, and of course she comes too late to her boyfriend already. The gods are very fortunate to her, and she's allowed to run once more. And the dog. But now she's able to jump over the dog. But the dog, Bob, the dog bites her with a scratch, which makes her dead. That's it. Anyway, it continues. She's not coming in time again, something like that. And then the third time, of course, she jumps over the dog, dog is not being by bitten, etc. runs. And you have to see the movie to find out how it ends. Anyway, this is sort of the end of my story. Yeah, well, this is Berlin, by the way. Berlin, because this is how I want to end. Look at the city. Look at Newcastle. Look at Berlin. Look at London. This is Berlin. And you look and you stand in front of it. You're a planner. And you, this is my city. I'm going to be the planner of this city. What shall I do? Do you want to control it? Do you want to mediate with all the actors? Well, there are quite a few of them. It's got to be some talking. Or what? Well, think about it. You can do both. You can do neither. But what you can do is say, look, this is quite a city. I do hope this city by and large will evolve by itself. And I guess that's what most cities are doing. If you really think about what we control as planners, do we really control the city? Quite don't. Which means, for me, an argument to say, look, that's be fair. And let's see how cities do evolve. Let's see what our task is. And if we accept a city as a system that evolves more or less autonomously with spontaneous patterns, perhaps the task of the planner is to think through what the consequences of this direction might be in case you expect a positive result. Quite embrace it. In case you see negative results, by trying to counter respond, try to avoid it. But that's a different perspective to what planners can be than a plan planner controlling the world, building neighborhoods, believing it's not demography that makes the planner build the neighborhood, but believes the planner is really creating something So this would be my message. And what we try to do. I think more and more schools is trying to consider a non-linear kind of rationality, which includes time, which includes the notion such as emergence, adaptivity, self-organization, etc. Not to get rid of the material we always been using, no, but to add to it, to contribute to a wider understanding and a better understanding of the world to become. So this would be my ending, the plan of becoming manager of change, while standing in the horror, I'm afraid, of the Thank you.